Well, good morning, church. I know that there are just about more of you in the lobby right now than there are in the sanctuary. I'm going to invite you to find your way on in, and I'm going to welcome you to worship this morning. We've got several rows saved up front because this is a very special weekend in the life of the church. We're going to talk a little bit more about that. But as you've gathered this morning, I want to remind you of a few important things, draw your attention to a couple things, and then tell you some stuff that we didn't have room for on our bulletin. So as you're making your way in, make sure you grab a copy of our uh, bulletin today so you know what's happening in the life of the church. A couple things that I want to lift up that are especially important today. Um, first of all, this those not written down things. This Thursday at 5 p.m., we have an opportunity to have a special time. We've got some students who are actually in summer school. And so we have a chance to provide them with some extra food this summer. So it, it was not an expected event, but it's an opportunity. So if you're available at 5 o'clock on Thursday evening and can come and help bag some bags, I think we're doing five weeks. Is that right? So uh, we'll need your help, all hands on deck, to make sure those bags are full for the students that we're able to serve. We're so thankful for an extra chance to bless the kids in our community with some food. So if you've got an opportunity, please, this Thursday, this week, May 20th at 5 p.m., be here for Brown Bag Buddies. Secondly, I want to let you know that we've been collecting lots of articles for Operation Christmas Child. Yes, it's Christmas in May. That's what we're talking about. Uh, but we're going to have a craft night here on Monday night, May 24th at 6 p.m. to start assembling some fishing kits and some sewing kits and to cut those t-shirts that you've been donating to get ready to make jump ropes and hacky sacks. So uh, mark your calendars. There's something to do for everyone. My mother-in-law visited with us last time we had a craft night. She loves to do those kinds of things. And she even took some back to Ohio and brought them back the next time she came. So uh, we'd love to have you here and involved. I also want to let you know that right at the end of service today, we're going to have a time of anointing prayer. There are several folks in our fellowship. But also there are some folks in our fellowship who are dealing just with some significant infirmity. And so we're going to conclude our service today with a time of anointing prayer for all of those individuals. So um, if you are in need of healing prayer then I'm going to invite you to come up at the end of service. There's a designated time, and we'll tell you when that is. Now, I don't want to make a real big deal, but you know we're going to make a real big deal this morning because I'm Taylor is in the house. He <laughs> turned 100 years old today. And uh, you might like to know that uh, Mayor Joe Judge up at Acorn Estates this week and pronounced May 13th, 2021 as I'm a Jean Taylor Day. We, uh, we think every birthday is significant, but it's not always that we have centenarians in our midst. And so we're going to do something that we don't do all the time, but it seems fitting today. Would you join me in singing happy birthday to I'm a Jean this morning? Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Ima Jean. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> Sister, we love you. It is good to have you and your whole family in the house. This is a special Sunday. Uh, we've got generation upon generation here to celebrate with Ima Jean. And so I know you'll want to take an opportunity, if you weren't here yesterday, to extend your love and best wishes to her. I'm a Jean, we thank God for your life, but more importantly, we thank God for the testimony and the witness that you have shown in your love for Jesus Christ. And I believe that I can say on behalf of this church family that it is our hope that with the days that God has numbered for us, that we live a life that is pleasing and honoring to him and that we are constantly drawing people toward him as you do each day of your life. I want you to know that she was witnessing to one of the workers at Acorn Estates trying to make sure they had a church. And when the mayor got done reading her proclamation, she was like, do you have a church home? So I'm just saying 
Even at 100, you can invite people to church and welcome them into the presence of Jesus. I'm Jean knows that's what God's call on her life, and we celebrate you today, sister. We love you very much. Well, happy birthday to you as well. What a special thing to get to celebrate a birthday with your great-grandma. So congratulations to you. All right. Friends, we're so grateful to be in the house of the Lord today. I want to lift up for you as a call to worship uh, Psalm 16 this morning from the message. So if you are able, will you stand for the reading of the word? Psalm 16, keep me safe, O God. I've run for dear life. Say to God, be my Lord, for without you, nothing makes sense to me. And all of these God-chosen lives all around me, what splendid friends they've made. My choice is you, God, first and only. And now I've found out I'm your choice too. You set me up with a house and a yard, and now you've made me your heir. The wise counsel you give when I'm awake is confirmed by my sleeping heart. Day and night, I'll stick with God. I've got a good thing going, and I'm not going to let go. I'm happy from the inside out. From the outside in, I'm firmly formed. For you have canceled my ticket to hell. That's no longer my destination. You've got my feet on the life path, and I am radiant from the shining of your face. Ever since you took my hand... I'm walking in the right way. We know that we've come into the presence of the Lord. He's extended his hand to us. And now today we stand and worship him. Will you worship the Lord with me this morning? So when I find out, find on my 
Good morning, church family. For those of you that I have not had an opportunity to meet, my name is Jonathan Irvin, and 
Uh, I'll be coming as uh, your uh, associate pastor of students and families here in June. Um, I'm glad to be with you this morning. I've been looking for some housing and uh, this week, so I uh, just decided I'd stay and uh, visit with, with my church family this morning. So um, if you would like to be seated, you're more than welcome to uh, as we go to prayer. If you uh, would like to remain standing, you're welcome to do that. Um, I would like to uh, just add a little announcement before uh, prayer. Um, if there are any 7th through 12th grade students or parents that would like to um, get a little bit more information about the uh, Illinois Ministries um, uh, youth camp this summer, um, if you'd like to meet over here in the overflow seating area after service, uh, I can give you just a little bit of information about that and um, uh, would certainly encourage you to, uh, to participate if you are a youth age student. Uh, we'd enjoy uh, taking you to that trip, so getting to know you a little bit better. So anyway, um, as we turn to prayer this morning, perhaps uh, you have a uh, need on your heart that you'd like to make known with an uplifted hand. The Lord sees those needs. He knows the heart. I invite you to uh, go to prayer with me. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful uh, to be in your presence today. We are overwhelmed in your presence, Father. You're so good to us. We don't deserve it, but you're so good to us, Father. This morning, um, as there's been needs that have been uh, voiced by an uplifted hand, Father, you see those needs. You know the heart of everyone in this room. And I just ask that you would... Uh, work in those situations, Father, that you would speak peace uh, where peace needs to be spoken, that you would give comfort where comfort is needed, Father, that you would uh, heal infirmities, Father, that you would uh, touch people's bodies, that you would still people's spirits, Father. As Pastor Joy prepares to come and deliver the word this morning, I just ask that you would just fill her with a new portion of your spirit today, Father, that um, she would be your servant this morning, speaking the words that you have for the people here this morning, Father. We thank you for this time that we're able to gather together. We, uh, we just love to be in your presence, Father. We ask all these things in Jesus' name, amen. Uh, before I step into the word and right before I dismiss our children, I want to acknowledge uh, this is graduation weekend for people. Um, and as you might expect, uh, graduation weekends are exceedingly busy. So sometimes the people we want to honor don't actually get to be with us. Uh, so we want to acknowledge uh, Chris and Eric Moore's daughters, Ashley and Bree, both graduated from Wabash Valley College this weekend. We're certainly proud of both of them. And we have two uh, other graduates that we want to honor. Their families are here today, so we're just going to ask uh, someone from their family to come, Colby Ward and TJ Mobley. And we have gifts for both of those young men. So, Beth, if you would come for just a minute, and uh, Cynthia, if you could come. We want to give to you something, uh, a gift from the church and a card from someone else in the church, just a reminder that we love your boys for them and we pray that God's blessings on them for the future. And so would you help me celebrate all our graduates today? And now before Cynthia sits down, she is uh, she has prepared a great lesson for our kids today. And so if your children are between the ages of four and 12 and they'd like to go with Miss Cynthia, she's got a helper today and Elijah and maybe some other hands. It looks like maybe Amber's going to help Cynthia so you can follow back to that back door if you'd like to go and hang out with the kids today. Relax, apparently. And we'll give you time to move. If you be down the hall. We got everybody. I just want to reiterate how thankful 
I am that God continues to bring children into our fellowship. And whether the children that are with us today are guests of Imogene's family or a regular part of our church family, we know that every child is a blessing from the Lord. And we give thanks to God for the privilege and the opportunity to teach them more about His love and grace. And we are so thankful for our volunteers who make sure that our kids have a quality lesson and some activities um, so that they can learn while we're learning too. So friends, we've got to up our game, right? Because the way that we prepare to lead God's children and the next generations of people in his way is that we prepare our hearts and continue to be students of his word. And so we're going to step into that right now. We're in a series called First Love. So if you're a, a guest today, if you're a family member, if you're a regular attender and maybe you've missed out we're talking about our first love, which is Jesus Christ, and the ways that perhaps the world has pulled our attention away from our first love. And we've been reading Paul's letter to the church at Philippi, which has some pretty significant impact for the modern church today. Part of our challenge in this particular series has been to spend some dedicated time memorizing two particular verses of Scripture found in Philippians chapter 3. We're actually going to step into studying that text today, but I want to give you an opportunity one more time to recite that verse with me. The more that we repeat the Word of God, the more we embed it in our hearts and it comes to us at times when we need it. This is a challenging text because it's a text of confession, and we're confessing about the things that we want, and we're actually asking the Lord for things that perhaps we didn't know we wanted. And so if you will... Uh, I think we've got it on the screen. Do we still have that slide? Do you know? Okay, no worries. If you want to open your scripture this morning, and hopefully you don't have to, right? Because we're trying to memorize it together. Isn't that the point? Philippians chapter 3, verses 10 and 11. Would you repeat it with me? I want to know Christ and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of sharing in his sufferings Becoming like him in his death and so attaining to the resurrection of the dead. I want to know Christ. I want to know the power of his resurrection. I want to fellowship with him. And see, that's where we get real quiet when we repeat the verse, right? I want to fellowship. I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings. And I want to become like him in his death. Well, today we're going to talk about what that meant for Paul and what that can mean for us. So one more time, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the word today from Philippians chapter 3. We're going to back up to verse 7 and read all the way to verse 16. Here is the word of the Lord. But whatever pertains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have yet taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind, and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us, then, who are mature, should take such a view of things. And if on some point you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. Only let us live up to what we have already attained. This is the word of God for the people of God, and we say, thanks be to God. You can be seated. And now for just a moment, as we do each week in our fellowship, I'm going to invite you to bow your head and quiet your heart and ask, Holy Spirit, what is it that you want me to hear from your word today?
knowing you, Jesus. There's nothing greater. Today we would ask that as we lean into your word and unpack what it means to know you more, that you would give us eyes to see your truth, courage to embrace it, and boldness to walk in it. And as for me, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable and pleasing in your sight, for you are my rock and my redeemer, and you are worthy of our praise. Amen. So this particular passage in Philippians is kind of a loaded text. I purposefully didn't read to you the verses that precede this word from Paul because Paul basically spells out his resume to people. In the verses that precede this passage that we're talking today, Paul basically tells everybody, look, if you can be a Christian numero uno, I'm your dude. I've done all the things. I have the pedigree. I have the professional resume. I am a professional Christian by trade. That's how I was raised. I was taught and raised to be a Pharisee by one of the greatest teachers of all time. I'm of the people of Israel. I'm from the tribe of Benjamin. Nobody can say I was never zealous because before I knew Jesus, I persecuted the church. My resume, my pedigree, my professional vita speaks for itself. He lays it out. Point by point. And quite frankly, if we were comparing ourselves to Paul, we'd all feel very small. But it's what Paul says next, friends, that is the point of challenge not just for him but for us, but for anyone who says, I want to know Christ. Because after he lists all of his qualifications, after he lists everything that makes him numero uno, in the eyes of law-abiding citizens of God, this is what he says. Whatever mattered to me before doesn't matter to me anymore because the only thing that matters is Jesus. Now, if you don't know the story well, before we knew him as Paul, we knew him as Saul. And Saul was a Pharisee of Pharisees. He was zealous, but he wasn't zealous for people who were following the way and pursuing a life, placing their faith in Jesus Christ. He was persecuting them, chasing them down, as it were, corralling them, gathering up, and having them thrown into prison. And yet on one of his journeys, Saul had a dramatic encounter with the person of Jesus Christ the resurrected person of Jesus Christ. And that encounter changed his life. It left him, as we would describe him, blind. He couldn't see. He was dependent on other people for help. But in some ways, the blindness that Paul experienced wasn't just a physical blindness. What what the Lord gave to Paul in that moment was an opportunity to see truly for the first time in his life where he might not have been able to see visually in front of him because his sight was gone, he had time to search the eyes of his heart. And what he discovered there was that the things that had mattered to him before paled in comparison to this powerful encounter he had with the risen Christ who called him and invited him in to a different kind of relationship. And suddenly this man who'd spent his whole life making sure he went to all the right schools and sat at the feet of all of the right teachers who made sure that people knew what family he was from and that he had all of the paperwork and certifications and licenses and everything that everybody needed to be considered righteous in the eyes of God. Paul makes a dramatic statement. Now, remember, he's writing to the church at Philippi, and we've talked the last several weeks that people in Philippi were all about prestige. They were all about, well, mostly retired soldiers and wealthy people lived in Philippi. And we talked about how radical it was that even at the very beginning of his letter that Paul described himself as a slave to Jesus Christ. This is not how you open the letter and get people to pay attention. But in a moment, what Paul says is my pedigree and my professional resume, literally, this is the world's version of the best credentials 
to be righteous before God. And none of that matters anymore because I met Jesus. And he's not just changed my thinking. He's changed everything about me. And so I want you to hear these words and the weight of them. What Paul says is, whatever were, this is past tense, whatever in the past I considered valuable. He's using economic language in a community where people are wealthy. Whatever were gains to me, that means whatever I was staking my future on, whatever I hoped was building for me a long-term investment, whatever I put all my stock in, so to speak, whatever was a gain to me, I now count as a total loss because instead I have gained Jesus. He doesn't just speak about it in the past tense either. He begins to speak about it in the present tense. He doesn't just say what was in the past isn't worth anything anymore. Here's what he says. What is more, I consider everything a loss. Paul's fast-forwarded from the way he built his life before Jesus to his present life in Jesus. What he's saying is, look, I know, I had a great pedigree, I had a great resume, I, I understand I put too much stock in it, but I need you to know that everything else in front of me right now, when I look at my life, there is nothing I own, nothing you could give me, nothing you could bring to me, nothing you could offer me, that will matter more than Jesus. And here's how he describes who Jesus is to him. He says, What's more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. What is surpassing worth? What does that mean? We don't use language like that. So what is Paul saying to people? Here's what he says. There is nothing that matters more than Jesus, but knowing Jesus is an above and beyond experience. See, I could try to place a value on my relationship with Jesus and say it matters this much, and then God would say, no, 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 it matters more than that. That every encounter I have with Jesus is above and beyond the one I had before. Perhaps you remember a song that maybe your parents or grandparents sang. Every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Every day with Jesus, I love him more and more. Every day with Jesus, he's the one I'm living for because every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. That's what Paul's saying here. Here's the thing. He knocked me blind. The scales fell from my eyes and when I could really see, when I could see for the first time in a way I'd never seen before, what I saw was that everything I built my life on didn't matter at all. Everything that I thought, every, every way that I had shaped my life, every way that I had built being righteous before God was rubbish. Now, what Paul is not doing is pointing a finger at Jews and saying being a Jew doesn't count. What he's saying is the value that I placed on things in my life that I thought were important, when I encountered Jesus, he gave me a new set of lenses. Anybody ever gone to the eye doctor for an exam? And you sit in front of the machine, and they say A, and they click it, or B. One, click, or two. Is, is there anybody in the room that would confess sometimes you're like, can you do that again? I can't really tell, right? I, I'm not sure. A or B? Okay, let's move on. No, 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 don't move on. I want to know, is it A or B? Which one's right? Paul has had a radical sight adjustment. I mean, it's like spiritual Lasix, Okay. He's had the kind of corrective surgery that suddenly allows him to see like he didn't before. And he says, there is nothing in life that is worth more than Jesus. Because knowing Jesus, Paul says, is an above and beyond investment. When I choose to place my trust in my life in him, when I trust him with everything I am, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. Now here's what Paul doesn't say. Once I place my life in Jesus, I never had one more trouble. I think that we've all concluded life is hard. Life is hard with or without Jesus. But the kind of life that we can live and the way that we understand the difficult things that we walk through can be shaped by a different set of lenses. Jesus didn't promise 
that there wouldn't be suffering if we chose to place our faith in him and follow him and trust him. But this is what he said. I will redeem all of that suffering for something you can't see. The pain that you experience. Now, can we go back to Philippians chapter 2? Jesus had the pedigree. Jesus had the resume. He was fully equal with God. And he himself did not consider equality with God something that he needed to cling to. And so he put on flesh and he came down here to this sometimes it feels like God forsaken place. The earth is not forsaken by God, but it is forsaken of God by people. And he walked in our midst and he laid his life down so that we could see that nothing is better than him. Perhaps you've heard the song on the radio, Graves into Gardens. The anthem of that chorus simply says, oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. Nothing is better than you. How can we sing a song like that when the world is full of things that attract us and woo us and pull us in and make us feel good temporarily? Perhaps you've heard me tell the story of an evangelist who came to college when I was a student at Anderson University, and many of you would know her name, Lori Salerno. And she talked about an encounter that she had with a woman from her gym who wanted to know why she was happy all the time and why she always seemed so bubbly and glad to see people. And Lori was sitting at a bagel shop and she'd been praying for a moment to witness to this woman and she looked down and she held up the bagel and she said to the woman, who is, by the way, much bigger and much tougher than she was, what's missing from this bagel? And the woman was like, are you kidding me right now? I'm asking you about what makes you happy and you're asking me about your breakfast, right? She's like, no, what's missing? And the lady was like, the center of the bagel, And Lori said, that's right. And what fits back in the center of the bagel? And the lady said, the piece of dough that came out of it. And she said, exactly. Let me tell you why I'm happy. Because I've found what fits the center of the hole in my life. I have a God-shaped hole. And I can put anything in that God-shaped hole, but nothing will fill me like God. Part of the question God wants us to wrestle with today is what have we been taking stock in? What have we been valuing more than Jesus? What is it that we've been shoving in the God-shaped hole, believing it will satisfy as much as him? Because Paul had it all. Paul was at the top of his class, valedictorian of rabbi school. I mean, like this guy was it. You didn't get smarter. You didn't get more righteous. According to the law, you didn't get more anything than Paul. And in the presence of the face of Jesus, he says, none of it is worth anything to me because Jesus is worth everything to me. The title of today's message is a question. Perhaps you've heard it. You go to a garage sale, you're looking at something, or or you're having a garage sale and somebody comes up and they're like, well, how much do you want for it? And this is the question that sometimes gets asked. Well, what's it worth to you? Are you willing to sell that? Well, what's it worth to you? I would ask you the same question today, friends. What's Jesus worth to you? Because to Paul, it was worth letting everything go. And I understand the context that we live in today. I understand that perhaps the greatest battle that the enemy has us engaged in is wanting to make earth a heaven. We talked about this a couple of weeks ago, that when Paul says to live as Christ, his gain really means it because he's not trying to make heaven on earth. Christ brought heaven to earth for a season, but then he went to prepare a place for us. And Paul said, here I've got work to do. I want to make sure everybody knows how good Jesus is, that nothing is better than him, that I would literally give up everything to know him more. But the wrestling match for us is that we don't live Christ and believe that dying is gain. We believe that living is gain and dying will mean Christ. And Paul has had a radical shift in his thinking. Well, easy for Paul, you say. Jesus met him on the Damascus Road. Friends, Jesus will meet you in the parking lot. 
You don't have to have a radical earth shattering, light open up from heaven, angel choir singing, spotlights start to flash all around you to have an encounter with Jesus here right now. And he's ready to give you the same gift that he gave to Paul. Because here's, here's maybe some big news you didn't know. The Lord loves you as much as else. Paul was a great man. He planted many churches. He radically changed the shape of the church as we know it today. He has left us instruction that is helpful to us. The living and active word of God. Paul more than... And so we walk through life grasping and straining at all kinds of things that we want to put in our God hole because we think they're valuable and nothing. There's nothing that's better than Jesus. Easy for you. You say he's Paul. He planted churches. He had it all figured out. Did you catch the end of the text today? Not that I have already obtained all this, Paul says. I'm not there yet. I want to know more of Christ. When Paul says, I want to know Christ, he doesn't say, I've got him figured out. He says, I want to know, and then I want to know him some more, and then I want to know him some more. And there are like means. I want to know Christ. I want to know him intimately. I don't want book knowledge. I don't want to read commentaries. I don't want to have a theological knowledge of Jesus. I want to have a personal knowledge of Jesus. I want to know the man that changed my life so radically that I would that was important and say it's not anymore. I want to know him. And I want to know the power that he's filled me with. The same power that was the power that he raised Christ up from the dead with. That lives now in me. And I want to know what it means that my suffering matters. I want to know that when I feel like I'm dying a little every day to myself. That God is doing that for something else he's shaping in me. See, when we say, I want to know Christ, I want to know the power of his resurrection, I want to share in the fellowship of his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, what I'm saying is, I want to become the person who doesn't consider everything valuable something to hang on to, but just like Jesus did, I humble myself. And I lay it down. And I deny myself every day, and I take up a cross and I follow because he will redeem it for something I can't see. And Paul says, listen, friends, I'm not there yet. He says to the church at Philippi, you know my resume. It would be real easy to think I've arrived, but I need you to know I haven't. And so I press on. Paul uses running language. He's in a race. And and the language he uses here to say, I press on to take hold of that for Christ Jesus took hold of me. Here's what he's saying. I'm in a race, and I see somebody out in front, of me and I'm going to chase that person down. After I get to that person, I'm going to chase the next person. It's a strategy that runners use to keep hold. If you watch a real tight cluster of people as they come close to the finish, they apply something they call the kick, right? They have just a little in their reserve tank. And so then you see the kick, and suddenly... They've run 26 miles, and the last point, too, they've got just enough to go a little bit faster. That's what Paul's talking about here. I'm going to kick it in. I haven't gotten there yet. I can see the finish line ahead of me, but I got a kick. And so I press on. I'm reaching out for what lies ahead. He says, it's not, it's not something that will disappoint me. It's a prize. Finishes this language in his letter. He said, Everyone who is mature, everybody who's already begun a relationship with and if on some point you think differently, oh, I, I'm so glad that Paul included this in the letter. It's something that God's going to require of us. But he says, And if on some point, you think differently. What does that mean? If some point you think that maybe not everything is better than Jesus. If at some point you think, uh, I don't want to let go of this, I'll hang on to this and Jesus. If on some point, Paul says, you think differently, that too God will make clear to you. The question is, 
Do you want him to? What's it worth to you to know Jesus? What are the things that you have valued? I won't even say more than, I'll just say as much as your relationship with Jesus. What are the things that you place at an equal plane with Jesus? Paul says if, if you want to know Christ, you'll see that there's nothing that's better than him. There's nothing that's equal to him. He said that Jesus humbled himself and God elevated him so that the name of Jesus is above every other name. Friends, it's not just that there's nothing better than him. There's no one better than him. There's nothing you're going to stuff in that God-shaped hole that's going to satisfy you like Jesus. Not one thing. There's nothing to cling to. There's nothing to strive for. There's nothing to chase after. There's nothing to apply the kick for at the end of a race except to chase after more. This is why this text means so much. And so the question that the Holy Spirit is pressing into me and has pressed into me since the beginning of the week the question God has been asking me and I feel pressed to ask all of us is what is it worth to you? What are you clinging more tightly to than you are to Jesus? Because it isn't worth it. It's not worth it. Because Jesus is above and beyond. It's not just, oh, give me Jesus and that'll be enough. Snow. See, every day with Jesus is sweeter than the day before. When you make that investment, that faith investment in Jesus, the returns are always greater. So what is it worth to you? The well-known missionary Jim Elliott, who sacrificed his life to bring the gospel to a native people who instead of receiving the word, one day turned on him once said, he is no fool who gives away what he cannot keep in order to gain what he cannot lose. There's nothing in your life that is worth more than Jesus. And you can't take anything you have right now with you except the Spirit of God. You know how I know? I've never seen a U-Haul behind a hearse. There's nothing you can take with you except the presence of God in you. What's it worth to you to know him? The invitation that God presents to us today is to decide if you would rather gain the whole world or gain that which will give us eternal returns and let go, albeit likely slowly, and with a lot of fight to the things that we think matter. And so Trey and Bridget are going to come and give us an opportunity to respond to the word this morning. And I'm just going to offer you this. If you would sit for a minute with the question, what is Jesus worth to me? And then allow the Holy Spirit to say to you, but you have put this before me. Or this thing in your life matters more to you. And if you don't know how to make that assessment, open your checkbook and look at your calendar and you'll find out real quick what matters more to you than Jesus. But as the Lord reveals it this morning, because you surely know it, you are willing to hear his voice. Then my invitation to you is, don't wait another minute to know the Jesus that Paul met on the Damascus Road. Because he's here right now. And he is more than willing and waiting to give you an opportunity to experience nothing is better than him. Would you pray with me? Gracious God, we are humbled at the exceeding and abundant generosity that you provide to us. I think about the rich young ruler who came and met you in the quiet and who said, what good thing must I do to inherit eternal life? And when it came to righteousness according to the law, he said it all. And you asked him what it was worth to him, and you told him to sell everything he had. 
and to give it away and to follow you. And he walked away sad because something was worth more than you were. God, I don't know what it is in our lives that we have placed above you or before you or ahead of you, but truly nothing is better than you. And today our prayer would be less of me and less of the things I thought mattered and more of you. So let our prayer be today. You can have all this world. Give me Jesus. And it is in the precious name of the resurrected Jesus who is worth it all that we pray. Amen. If you would stand and respond as the Holy Spirit leads you, these altars are open and I invite you to use them today.
friends still praying uh, this morning worship today gifts before the Lord I'm so thankful that the Spirit of God is here I'm so thankful that he meets us where we are takes back from us those things that we have made more important than him and receives our surrender One of the ways that we do that is through the giving of our gifts and so we're gonna sing another song as an opportunity for you to Present your gifts to the Lord and continue to worship. And after this next song, then I'm going to come back up and I'm going to invite any of those of you who are coming forward to receive anointing for a surgery or a prayer of healing that you need imparted over you today. But would you pray with me as we bless the gifts that we're about to present to the Lord? Father, we're blessed beyond measure. The abundant generosity that you have in your grace and in your love and in your mercy. Father, when we look at the things that we have, we recognize that all of it has come from your hand. Scripture says that all good things have come from you. And so, Lord, we are finite and we are feeble, and you are mighty and miraculous. And so today we pray a blessing on the gifts that we bring, and we entrust them back into your hand. We believe in Jesus' name that the gifts that we bring will bring honor and glory to you as we strive to know you more and make you known in our community. And we thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's continue to worship.
And then if there are those of you who uh, would like to come forward and receive anointing for healing this morning, Greg Walker is going to have surgery on the 25th. I know that uh, Larry Whitaker is as well, and we're going to invite both of those brothers up at this time. But I know that there are some of you that are struggling with some physical infirmities this morning. And so we're just going to take an opportunity and invite you forward. And if there are those of you who would be willing to come and lay hands on these brothers or others who are asking for healing today, then I'm going to invite you to come as well. Scriptures tell us that um, where two or more are gathered together in his name, that he is in the midst of them. And we have no doubt that God has been in our midst today. But we also know that the prayers of the righteous are powerful and effective. And we know that God can impart healing by the power of his Holy Spirit, any which way he does. And we are asking today that in the name of Jesus, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, that he would go before you as his servants, for Larry and Greg into surgery, for Shirley into treatment, for Lynn into her appointments as she's seeking answers and asking God for healing. Are there others here this morning? Donna as well. We are asking the Lord to impart his divine healing on our brothers and sisters this morning because, friends, he's able. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father, you see your children here this morning and they are in need of a divine touch. Pray first for Larry Whitaker today. Lord, lay our hands upon him in faith, believing that you have the power to heal. And so, God, we are asking, should you choose to use the surgeons to bring that about, then we give you the glory. But, Lord, should you impart healing in another way, Father, by your hand and by your Holy Spirit, we ask for an anointing upon him today, from the top of his head to the soles of his feet, that you would give him relief and freedom, that you would restore his body, that you would strengthen him once again and empower him. Father, this is a servant who loves to work for you. And he has felt limited and frustrated. And we pray today that he would be blanketed with a cloak of peace and confident assurance that your Holy Spirit goes before him into this operating room, that your hands will steady the surgeon, that you will give wisdom and healing as only you can. And we trust you with him today, your servant, and we place him at the foot of your throne. There is no better place for him to be. And we believe for his healing today in Jesus' name. And Father, we pray also for Greg. Lord, we know that his knee has been troubled for a long time. And Lord, I think about when you knit him together from the very beginning, every bone and sinew, every tendon, every muscle, every vessel. But God, you even knew that his future would include these days. None of this is unfamiliar to you. And so just as the provenient grace of your Holy Spirit made a way once for him to come into relationship with you. Now we would pray that he would walk side by side with you into this moment, that your spirit would go ahead of him in that operating room, that you would cloak him with peace and confidence and assurance that your presence is there, that there wouldn't be a moment, Father, for Greg where he doesn't feel you near and know the peace that you can bring even in a time of uncertainty. And Lord, I'm just going to ask, because you've given physicians wisdom beyond our wildest imaginations, that you would give him greater strength in that leg, that you would give him greater endurance, and what feels like a small repair would be a total healing because you can do it. So God, we are asking that you would empower him, not only with healing, but that you would also empower him with be afraid or uncertain that that no fear or anxiety would cover over him but instead he would be free to experience and that it, if it be your will you give him an opportunity to testify of your goodness even in the midst of this this struggle and place that he's walking through we know you're going to redeem it because that's what you've promised and we ask you to go before him now father we also
that these treatments wouldn't just be preventative, Father, they would be restorative. Return to her the vision that you once gave her that she might even be able to see more. We're asking by the power of your Holy Spirit today to bring healing. Father, we pray for Lynn. Lord, we know that she's been suffering now for months in her back, in her neck. Lord, we're asking for answers. Tests can show some things, but we need Holy Spirit wisdom for her doctors, and we're asking for that today. We are believing in Jesus' name that when she goes to an appointment this week, that she'll have clarity and understanding. And we thank you for the brief relief that she's received. I want to thank you, God, that she came even in the midst of her pain to worship you today. It's a testimony to her confidence and her faith in you. And Lord, today, I know that Lynn comes with a heart that says there's nothing she wants to matter more than you. And the enemy wants to distract her with the pain that she's suffering with. And I'm asking right now that you would relieve that pain in the name of Jesus and allow her to walk out in freedom today. And Father, I pray for Donna. You know that she has had travail after travail over this last year with her health. And Father, now it's her knee. And we know that from the very beginning when you made us, you knew the challenges that we would face. And I am asking for restoration and healing. Lord, that whatever appointments need to take place, whatever uh, treatments are in place until surgery is an option down the road, God, we're asking that you would give her strength to continue to do the work that she's doing in your name and for you. Lord, as I stand before your servants today, they've all come with one thing in common confidence in your power. Lord, their infirmities may be different, but their God is the same God. And in your name today, we proclaim a healing power and touch on your servants. Lord, we are not living in a time where your hand and your miraculous work is absent. You can do it. And so we gather as a believing people today. Father, we also pray for Imogene, whose back has been suffering. We look at this saint and centenarian and we thank God for her, but she needs an anointing touch today. And so she might not be standing in this group, but oh Lord, she's assembled with us. And those prayers of faith have sustained us in times when we need it. And today we also pray for her. And for those who need a spiritual healing today, for those who need an emotional touch today, in every way, God, you are the provider and the healer. You are able to do exceedingly more than we could ever ask or imagine. So for the petitions that we have made before you today and the countless others that are going up quietly today, we rest them at your feet. Lord, we want healing and we ask for it in your name, believing that not only you can, but you will. And we proclaim it and believe it in the power of the resurrected Jesus and all of God's people gathered said, Amen. And we're singing our way out today. Give Jesus. Go in his peace. You are loved.